Okay, here's our first video lecture. Remember that this is critical information, so please pay attention and take notes, just like you would in a live lecture. After you watch the video, please take the corresponding video quiz on Brightspace. If you get any answers wrong, review your notes and rewatch the video and try the quiz again. Now let's get started thinking about the terms and concepts necessary for effective literary analysis. Two of the big topics we deal with when analyzing any form of literature is structure and pattern. We analyze how a poet has constructed a poem and the forms that resulted from those constructions. Or we analyze the patterns that the poet placed throughout the poem. Repetitions of sounds and images, rhyme and meter. Those two topics are important when analyzing graphic novels as well. If I ask you to think about the structure of a story, a narrative, probably the first thing that comes to mind is plot. And understanding the plot of a story is essential to understanding the story itself. The graphic novel is a narrative art form. It tells a story, whether fiction or nonfiction. So we need to understand the basic components of that story. You may have seen the plot of a story or novel or movie described like this, kind of a check mark. While some stories may look like this, it's a bit of a distortion. One cause that suggests by the Hollywood blockbuster movie genre. In those movies, and in many movies, you spend two hours watching all sorts of things happen and build up to that final hyperdramatic scene, the big battle, or something similar to it. So we've become used to thinking about how all narratives work. Everything is a slow build up to that final climactic moment, and then the credits roll. I want you to start thinking about plot and narrative in a more balanced approach. Here's a different way to think about plot. This is what we'll use for our discussions. Compare the two. What's the difference? Okay, yes, the one on the right has more components, but what else is different? Right, it's balanced. Now, that's not to suggest that the climax of every story occurs exactly halfway through the story. Rather, it suggests that each piece is equally important and that there is more even distribution. Two things I want you to keep in mind while thinking about plot are normalcy and conflict. We'll return to these when we talk about character in the next video. The exposition of a narrative is the background information. Some stories provide you with a specific explanation of what things are like before the story begins. Many, though, don't. When considering the exposition of a story, though, don't get bogged down in trying to identify each piece of background information. Many authors slowly feed us their characters' backgrounds as the story progresses. Exposition is much more formal than that. The exposition, if there is one, is the author stepping in at the beginning and saying, let me tell you how things used to be. Think about the Star Wars movies. That scrolling yellow text, that's the exposition. The exposition is what life was like for the protagonist before the story began. For better or for worse, it's what's normal. At some point in any good story, something happens to throw that idea of normal into disarray. At that point, what we call the rising action begins. Essentially, some conflict starts. Something or someone disrupts normal life. Suddenly, there is a problem that needs to be addressed or resolved. The rising action of a narrative is the series of events that show us an increasing amount of tension in the story. The climax, then, is the moment when the tension boils over. Again, with many Hollywood movies, the whole thing is rising action leading up to that one big battle scene that then ends the movie. Instead of thinking about conflict like that, think about it like this. The main character's life has been disrupted by some problem or crisis. As he or she tries to deal with that problem, the tension grows. Eventually, the character will respond to that increasing tension in a way that is irrevocable. It's a point from which the character cannot return to normal. That's what we really mean by climax. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, there's a sword fight at the end of the play. Some people read that and call it the climax, because that's how Hollywood would describe it. But the sword fight in Hamlet is not the climax of the play. The climax of Hamlet happens roughly halfway through the play, when Hamlet, in a fit of rage after realizing that his mother and his uncle have murdered his father, stabs a man named Polonius. Up to that point, Hamlet didn't know what to do. He struggled with the tension of his father's death, and he still had choices. Once he kills Polonius, though, there is no going back. That's the true definition of a narrative climax. One thing that can help clarify the climax is understanding the next piece of a plot. The falling action is in many ways a mirror image of the rising action. Thus, another reason why our new diagram is a more effective way to think about plot. The falling action of a narrative is the series of events that occur as a direct result of that climactic action. In Hamlet, that sword fight is actually the final part of falling action. 
It happens as a direct consequence of Hamlet's killing of Polonius. But the falling action is also a time of change. When the rising action begins, remember, what was normal for the characters was altered. That's the crisis. At the climax, the character or characters act in response to those changes, but in a way from which they can't return. In a way, the climax is an instance of metamorphosis, for better or for worse. The falling action, then, is a continuation of that metamorphosis. The protagonist and his world continue to change as a result of that conflict in the climax. At some point, a resolution occurs. Things settle down and the crisis ends. But the characters in the world in which they live are altered forever. Some stories end right there, but others go on for a bit. When they do, we call this the denouement. This is the new normal for the characters. It's the world permanently altered by the conflict and crisis of the story. So there we have our framework for plot. Regardless whether we are reading fiction or nonfiction, so long as it is a story, a narrative, we want to analyze its plot using this framework. As we're wrapping up with plot, I want to introduce one other idea. Our understanding of narrative storytelling is based on the ideas developed by the ancient Greeks as they were creating plays. An important aspect of ancient Greek drama was the idea of spectacle. In this sense, spectacle is what we see on the stage when we watch a play. It's all of the action, small and large. It's the character's movements and appearance and all the other visual input we receive. So how can we translate that to reading comics? I think this is an important difference between reading a story in text only and reading a story as a comic. We once again have that visual input and we need to pay close attention to it. Much of what's discussed in the McLeod book and in our class meetings will help us describe and analyze the spectacle of these stories. All right, thanks for watching. Remember to complete video quiz one on Brightspace before our next class meeting. If you get any answers wrong, rewatch this video and try again.